One of the most interesting anecdotes from the making of the epic retro Bollywood film Mughalyazam relates to Anar Kali's pond. The director of Mughalyazam, K. Asif, reportedly stopped the shooting of Mughalyazam for three days because he wanted a pond filled with real Atar for his Anar Kali played by Madhubala. Atar is an essential oil that is derived from flowers and other natural sources that provides a strong fragrance. The director wanted a pond filled with real athar so the actress would have the perfect close-up expression because of the sweet smelling pond. Initially the production team filled the pond with water but K. Asif was not satisfied. The production team told the director that they could not fill the pond with real athar because it would cause a delay of three days. The director stopped shooting for three days in order for his request to be fulfilled. Another anecdote from the making of Mughalyazam relates to a pair of shoes. The director K. Asif insisted that the shoes that the Emperor Akbar wore, played by the actor Prithviraj Kapoor, had to have real pearls on them, which made them very expensive. The shoes were not going to have any close-up shots in the film, so the cinematographer of the film, R. D. Mathur, asked the director why he insisted on buying the shoes with real pearls when a shoe with imitation pearls would serve the purpose. K. Asif reportedly responded, Your camera may not see the shoes significantly significantly in the shot. But when my Akbar wears those shoes and walks, he will feel every inch an emperor. And that expression is what the camera will capture. The Mughal Azam is considered to be one of the most fascinating Bollywood films to ever be made. It represents a landmark in Indian cinema for various reasons. But the word that really epitomizes the film is grand or grandeur. It was K. Asif's grand vision of the Mughal era that made the film the epic that it is considered to be today. It was the most expensive film of its era, be it the costumes, the sets, the battle scenes, the songs, the dances, and the dialogue. Mughalyazam was off the top, yet authentic. It has been said that three films could have been made from the footage used for Mughalyazam. The making of Mughalyazam was filled with mayhem and madness. The making of the film could, by itself, be a really interesting film, and I truly hope that at some point, it's made into a series or a film, being the making of Mughalyazam a film. In release, in August 1960, Mughalyazam was a major success and redefined the presentation of the Indian film. It set a precedent for this grand style of filmmaking that continues to inspire directors today, especially the director Sanjay Leela Bansali. And it is a uniquely Indian presentation of film. So Mughalyazam took 16 years to make in total. The shooting of the film started in 1944, but the film was ultimately completed and released in 1960. During this time, there was excitement surrounding this film, but also haters. In 1955, the Illustrated Weekly of India wrote, A conspicuous example of wanton extravagance and unbusinesslike methods is Mughalyazam. It is a black and white picture, but silver, gold, and precious stones have been lavishly used in sets, properties, and costumes. About 3 million rupees are reported to have been spent so far. Mughalyazam is categorized as a historical film but it is not at all historically accurate. It represents the vision of the director Karimuddin Asif or as he was known K. Asif. Prithvi Raj Kapoor played the role of Emperor Akbar, Dilip Kumar was Prince Salim and Madhubala played the role of Anarkali. Although the major focus of the film seems to be the forbidden love story between Prince Salim and Anarkali, if you look at the posters of the film, you would think that, the film actually focuses more on Emperor Akbar. The the director maintained a strong focus on the perspective of his Emperor Akbar. In 1960, Mughalyazam released in 150 theatres simultaneously. This was a huge feat in those days. After its release, this review appeared in Filmfare magazine. Mughalyazam is a tribute to the imagination, hard work and lavishness of its maker. For its grandeur, its beauty and the performance of its artists, it should be a landmark in Indian films. Original Mughalyazam was a black and white film with some parts of the film in color. When Technicolor became available in India in the 1950s, K. Asif actually wanted to reshoot the whole of Mughalyazam. By that point, he had already shot three quarters of the film in black and white and spent more than the usual budget of a Hindi film 
of that time. His financiers refused and the director settled by adding some scenes in color. This included the Shish Mahal Palace of Mirrors sequence. In 2004, Mughaliyazam became the first film in world cinema to be colorized for a theatrical release. A colorized version of Mughaliyazam was released in theaters after a painstaking restoration and colorization process. Although there is divided opinion on the colorization of originally black and white films, the restoration did bring a whole new generation of fans to the film. In audience research conducted on the quality of the 2004 version, it seemed that the audience felt that adding color to the film was a visual upgrade, if done well. But there were colorization continuity snags noted in the 2004 version. For example, despite this being the same scene, Anar Kari's dresses had different colors in the scene. The process of restoration and colorization took nearly three years, and the budget was that of a new film. Also, like I said before, K. Asif wanted Mughalayazam to be in color when it it became an option. Mughal Azam is a film that had no set budget. The costs were ongoing and tremendous. The drama surrounding money, the relentless vision of the director K. Asif, love affairs on set, a death, scandal and gossip, the fallout between the main couple Madhubala and Dilip Kumar, K. Asif almost being removed from the film only to cause Madhubala and Dilip Kumar to rally in his corner and advocate for him to continue the project makes Mughal Azam a very fascinating film to discuss. So before we go any further, hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Tess and I discuss South Asian books, films and culture on my channel. And in this video essay, I will be discussing the mayhem and the madness of making the masterpiece Mughalayazam, a film that really changed the landscape of filmmaking in India. So if my t-shirt did not tell you this already, this film is so interesting to me for so many reasons. I will also be speaking specifically on Madhubala Narkali because she is such a significant and outstanding part of this film. important to remember that Mughal Azam does not attempt to be a historically accurate film or a biopic on the Emperor Akbar. It is set in the 16th century Mughal period during the rule of Akbar. The film is in fact based on a play titled Anar Kali written by Imtiaz Ali Taj. Even then K. Asif adapted the stage version to his own vision for the film. Mughal Azam was the second film that K. Asif directed. He initially worked as a tailor in Bombay and was introduced to the film world by his uncle who was an actor. Throughout his life, he only had three and a half films to his credit. He died before completing what would be his final project, the film Love and God. But with Mughal Azam, he left his name in the proverbial golden letters of Indian film history. His dream was to make a film on the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Unfortunately for him, after independence, his first producer for Mughal Azam migrated to Pakistan. As a result, shooting had to be scrapped. At this time, about 25% of the film had already been shot and 10 truckloads of film was wasted. This version of Mughal Azam had a mostly different cast with the actress Nargis playing Anar Kali. It took K. Asif four years to find the businessman S.P. Mystery who became the film's new financier. A huge reason why this long drawn out film was made was because S.P. Mystery was all also an admirer of the Emperor Akbar and had a passion to see this version of Akbar on screen. Changes to the cast were made and a year after shooting had already begun, Madhubala was chosen to play Anar Kali. As set out in the book Mughal Yazan, Legend as Epic, Asif's ambition was unbridled and the scale of the production kept going up. Shapurji, SP Mystery, kept asking Asif for a budget and the expenditure always exceeded the projected figures substantially. Sometimes it created tension between Shapurji and Asif, leading to stoppages, but Shapurji always relented and kept his trust in Asif. By the time the film was completed in 1960, it had cost about 1.5 crore. The normal budget for a film with top stars those days would vary between 12 and 15 lakh. Actual shooting days over 10 years amounted approximately to 500, while most of the film was shot in black and white. About 20 minutes of it, two reels, including the famous Shish Mahal set, were shot in color. For the battle scenes, 
one full division, about 8,000 soldiers of the Indian Army was employed in Rajasthan for about two months. Financiers kept pouring money into what seemed a bottomless pit. K. Asif laid down the law, getting exactly what he wanted from everyone. But he did it with persuasive tact and lots of style, managing to have his own way without ruffling feathers and hurting egos. Mughal Azam is based on the play Anarkali by Imtiaz Ali Taj and this play was written in 1922 and subsequently rewritten in 1931. The play contained familiar elements in popular plays. The themes of the play were also used in the film but notably K. Asif changed the ending. The play ends more tragically for every character especially Anarkali as she dies in the staged version. To start let's discuss how the story unfolds in the film. If you've watched the film you can skip to the next chapter but if you haven't or you want to refresh your memory or you just kind of want to know the story let's discuss the story very quickly. Opening scenes of Mughal Azam indicate that India is the narrator of the story. Akbar is introduced as a humble emperor who loved his people and this land. After this we discover that the Hindu wife of Akbar Jodhabai has given birth to a son. As time passes the young Prince Salim is indulgent and he is sent away from the palace to receive training as a warrior. Many years later, he returns and there is a celebration. Har, a servant girl close to the Empress, meets Sangtarash, the sculptor, to commission a statue for this celebration. Nadira is another servant girl. She is the model for the statue. The statue is not complete in time and Sangtarash makes Nadira stand in place of the statue. Later, upon seeing the statue, Prince Salim falls in love. Bahar, spying on the prince's movements, sees this. Next day, everyone has arrived to inaugurate the statue. Bahar, obviously in bad faith, suggests that the prince shoot an arrow at the strings near the statue. After the prince successfully shoots the arrow, it's discovered that the statue is in fact a human being. Akbar is impressed with her and bestows upon her the title of Anarkali. He also says that Anarkali will play the role of Radha during the Janmashtami celebrations, a Hindu celebration of the birth of the Hindu god Krishna. It is during the Janmashtami celebration in the film that Anarkali dances to the famous song Mohe Pangat. There is an unexpressed love that is forming between Prince Salim and Anarkali. Suraya, Anarkali's sister, notices this. She becomes the go-between for Prince Salim and Anarkali. Salim writes a letter to Anarkali expressing his feelings and then goes to meet her. It is here that she points out to him the difficulties that their relationship faces due to their different statuses. Bahar spies on them during this intimate exchange. Later, Bahar suggests that Anarkali and her participate in a poetry contest and this results in this famous song sequence, Tere Meh Fil Meh moment in the film, which kind of became a meme recently with Farhan Akhtar and Abed Diol, so you've seen the meme. Man Singh is Akbar's general and right-hand man. He discusses Prince Salim's lack of interest in state matters. Salim sends a message to Anarkali that he wants to meet. The lovers meet and spend time together in the garden while a concert is happening. It is here that the famous romantic feather scene happens. Bahar witnesses this and witnesses their meeting and is subsequently found out and confronted by Prince Salim. Bahar discreetly informs the emperor about the lovers. Akbar goes to confront Prince Salim when he finds the lovers together. Just before then, Prince Salim expressed to Anarkali that he wants her to be the empress of Hindustan. Anarkali faints and is then imprisoned. Prince Salim is furious. He wants Anarkali to be released. While imprisoned, Anarkali reflects on the state of affairs. Then brought before Akbar in heavy chains. Akbar commands her to break all ties with Prince Salim. She is freed under the assumption that she will do this. The lovers meet again, but Prince Salim is manipulated by Bahar. She lies and tells him that Anarkali struck a deal with Akbar. Gold for freedom, and after her Navroz performance that night, she will leave the palace forever. Navroz is the first day of the Persian New Year. This results in Prince Salim becoming enraged and he assaults Anarkali. When Navroz is celebrated in the Shish Mahal, Anarkali performs the famous Pyar Kya To Dar Kya. This song is an open defiance to the emperor and his court. Anarkali for this action is imprisoned again. Prince Salim pleads with his father to accept their relationship. It's here when Akbar says that his role as an emperor comes first. 
Bahar gives Prince Salim the key to Anarkali's prison cell and he breaks Anarkali's shackles. As they try to escape, Bahar alerts Akbar. Throughout, we see a discussion between Akbar and his queen Jodhabai on the unfolding events. Anarkali is then imprisoned in the dungeon. After a back and forth with various characters, father and son go to war. Akbar represents fighting for his principles, whereas Prince Salim represents fighting for love. Just then, Durjan enters with Anarkali who has been praying during her imprisonment. Both father and son take their positions on the battlefield and when the war is over, Akbar is victorious. Prince Salim is imprisoned. When Prince Salim is on trial for sedition, Akbar says that if he handed over Anarkali, all the charges would be dropped. Salim refuses. Akbar then hands down the death sentence on his own son, saying that justice is dearer to him than even his own son. Akbar orders that the cannon be fired. Man Singh at the last moment lifts the barrel towards the sky. Anarkali, thinking that Prince Salim has been executed, faints. Anarkali is then brought to Akbar as a prisoner, who tells her that he will only release Prince Salim when she is dead. Akbar asks her to express her last wish and she responds that her last wish is to be the Empress of Hindustan like Prince Salim wanted her to be. Akbar tells Anarkali that she will be given a rose, that she should give this rose to Prince Salim at the opportune moment so that he becomes unconscious. That night when Anarkali gives Salim the rose, he smells it and gradually begins to lose consciousness. Anarkali is then led away. Anarkali's mother visits the Emperor and pleads for her daughter's release, reminding him of the promise that he made to her when she brought him the news of Prince Salim's birth. Anarkali is then seen standing behind a wall. She will be entombed alive. As this happens, Akbar is riddled with guilt. As Anarkali's face disappears, the tomb is lowered into a tunnel. Just then, Akbar and Anarkali's mother enter the tunnel. Akbar points to the end and says that this route will take them beyond his empire. He says that they should go but keep the secret that Anarkali is alive. Hindustan then pronounces that, in this way, Akbar granted a lease of life to Anarkali and bore the stigma of tyranny and cruelty. However, I am witness to the sense of justice of this man whom the world knows as the Great Mughal. The essential conflict in Mughalism is that love has to combat many socio-political divides. But in this film, we see that there is a major focus on the perspective and the values of the Emperor Akbar. His character is extremely conscious of his role as the Emperor and the duty that he has to fulfill, even when other characters question his decisions. He is not necessarily the villain in the story. He just has a different perspective on the unfolding events. Mughalism, I watched Mughal Azam for the first time because of Madhubala as Anarkali. I'm a huge fan of Madhubala. Mughal Azam was Madhubala's last film and her most memorable. Although a mausoleum of Anarkali does exist in Lahore, there is no historical evidence to support the story. By this time, meaning when Mughal Azam was being made, the line between legend and history had become blurred and when K. Asif changed the ending, allowing Anarkali to live, contrary to the popular belief that walls were built around her and she suffocated to death, it was felt that he was tampering with history. When K. Asif approached Atullah Khan, Madhubala's father, to sign Madhubala for the film, Khan Saab put down his usual stipulations of no night shooting, no visitors on the sets, full script with dialogues in advance, the remuneration and so on. Asif left the room, but Madhubala beckoned to K. Asif and led him away from the room in which her father was seated and reassured him that everything could be straightened out. She persuaded him to just nod his head and assent to all her father's preconditions. How many women can do the role for eight years, a sick woman at that, and look as beautiful from the first shot to the last. She was absolutely photogenic, affirmed the cinematographer of Mughal Yazam, R. D. Mathur. There are so many references to Anarkali from Mughal Azam in pop culture and even in Indian films today. People still dress up as Anarkali, actors dress up as Anarkali, and she's just such an iconic character in Indian film history. Mughal Azam was recently adapted into a musical. The film was adapted into a musical with promotions occurring in Times Square. So this video essay is actually part two in a series that I'm currently doing on my channel on Madhubala. First video is 
this one where I discuss Madhubala and her ongoing comparison in connection to the Hollywood actress Marilyn Monroe. I will put the link to that video in the description box below. As I discuss in that video, Madhubala's eternal icon status is in part due to her portrayal as Anarkali in this film Mughalyazam. The finely etched and deeply involved performance of Madhubala has so identified Madhubala with the image of Anarkali that in more than 50 years since Mughalyazam's release, no further attempt has been made to bring another Anarkali to the screen. Anarkali is a compound word formed by the Persian word anar meaning pomegranate and the Hindi word kali meaning bud. Anarkali has a very fascinating position throughout this film. She is considered to be the personification of beauty and grace, but in fact she undergoes immense difficulty and struggle throughout the narrative, showcasing her courage and strength. We see that her depiction is from this very glamorous and beautiful court dancer to her being literally in chains. It is Anarkali who is mature enough to realize that the love affair between her and Prince Salim is not sustainable. Despite her love for him, she is anxious during the courtship. Her defiance and courage is depicted in the song Pyarkya to Darnakya, where she addresses the court and stands up for herself and what she believes in. Perhaps the most famous costume in this film is the outfit that Anarkali wore in the song Pyar Kia To Darna Kia. This style of dress is fashioned around the style worn by Kathak dancers. The colors of the outfit are very unique and dynamic. It's red and a light blue. A Mughal styled cap is used as an accessory with lots of jewelry. This silhouette was reportedly so popular that it came to be known as the Anarkali. Madhubala was just 20 years old when she joined the cast of Mughal Yazam. This character gave her the opportunity to really showcase her talent as an actress. For for Mughal Yasam, there were many versions of this Anarkali character depicted on the silver screen. Yet, it is Madhubala's portrayal of Anarkali that really outshines the others. The film was very important to Madhubala and she alone had the additional problems of ongoing health concerns. This made her even more determined to give off her best. Madhubala had several important scenes with Prithviraj Kapoor which formed an indispensable part of the story. Throughout the film, there are some intensely charged encounters where she more than held her own. Kali is arguably the best performance of Madhubala's entire career. She was famous for her beauty, so much so that her accomplished acting was often overlooked. Her makeup for Mughali Azam required long hours. The marble statue scene was particularly difficult. Her entire face was coated with layers of plasticine and the removal was even more difficult. For the scene itself, Madhubala was draped in a dress made of yards of heavy rubber sheets. She found it difficult to breathe in the costume. Madhubala also had to adjust for this very unique shooting schedule. It was expected by Atula Khan, Madhubala's father, that his daughter would be on set at 9.30 a.m. and leave at 6 p.m. and that she would not shoot at night. The demands of this film however broke those rules. In the making of Mughalyazam, Madhubala had to extinguish a candle with the palm of her hand. She had buckets of water flung at her face and had strenuous dance rehearsals. She reportedly fainted after being required to run across the sets many times. Another strenuous experience for her was being required to wear real iron chains on her hands. She had to wear them and walk with them, subject to their excruciating weight. She developed abrasions from the weight of her chains and had to be confined to bed in order for her to heal. Her colleague Sitara Devi reportedly said that these controversial chains may have hastened her end. The chain, the continuous night shooting, guru that Madhubala worked with for Mughalyazam was Lachu Maraj. Maraj did the choreography for Mughalyazam's dance sequences and Kawali. Madhubala alone who performed the song Mohe Pangat but she was reportedly medically forbidden from performing dance but she did it anyway for the film. Madhubala was not a classical dancer but for Mughalyazam she underwent training. Training had been extensive going on for two years and she performed most of the required dance Dances. Except there is an interesting anecdote regarding her dance performance in this song. The chief architect of the murals for Mughalyazam, B. R. Kedkar, had played a small but key role in the filming of the song. Because the required Kathak spins were complex and challenging to Madhubala, a male dancer, Lakshmi Narayan, performed the sequence during the shooting of the song, wearing a mask of Madhubala's face. B. R. Kedkar created this mask. The mask was so perfect that people must 
took it for being Madhubala herself. K. Asif asked Madhubala to pose for Kedkar for 10 minutes to make the mask. The nature of the storyline of Anarkali in Mughal Yazam in some ways paralleled the tragic life of Madhubala. During the filming of Mughal Yazam, the turbulent relationship of Madhubala and Dilip Kumar was even more strained. There were many times that although they carried out their professional obligations as Anarkali and Prince Salim, the actors were not even on speaking terms. In an interview, the late actor Ajit said that Madhubala shed many tears during the making of Mughal Yazam. Every shot with her prince was a trial and caused her trauma. It seemed that for Madhubala, both professionally and personally, making Mughal Yazam was a very challenging and difficult process. The years passed by one after the other and she willed herself to complete Mughal Yazam despite the stress she was under during the later years of its making and the overall strain and effort of working on this film. This is your reminder to like and subscribe to this channel if you are enjoying this video. Also, this is an opportunity for me to show off my beloved Mughalyazam t-shirt. <laughs>character that really gets overlooked in any character analysis of Mughal Yazam is Bahar and she does deserve some recognition as the master manipulator in the story. So Bahar really reminds me of the character of Iago from Shakespeare's Othello. In Othello, Iago is the master manipulator causing chaos and confusion. Iago is one of the best Shakespearean villains because he is just purely evil and does evil deeds in pursuit of his own ambition. She, Bahar, makes no secret of her ambition of winning Salim love and becoming empress of Hindustan one day. Such an ambition was not expected and was way beyond the reach of a Kanese servant girl in those days. This is where she stands in contrast to Anarkali. She keeps spying on them and utilizing her access to Akbar and Jodhabai to put obstacles in the part of Salim and Anarkali, the ultimate aim of removing Anarkali physically from this world. So clever is she that after major upheavals, her role remains undetected. She remains unpunished. She is a uniquely evil character in Indian cinema. In the scene with her friend, when Bahar wears the crown on her head, looks at herself in the mirror, her friend asks her if she is not afraid of harboring such ambition. The reply sums up her character. She says haughtily, those who desire to wear the crown do not fear anything. According to the book, A Hundred Iconic Bollywood Costumes, this is a film that will always be considered one of Indian cinema's finest. While there was a dedicated costume department that worked on the film, fashion was really about the director's vision. Director K. Asif wanted everything to be as authentic as possible. From the grand sets to the beautiful jewelry, which was all real. Footwork was ordered from Agra. Crowns were made by the skilled craftsmen of Kolhapur. Much of the jewelry came from the city known for its goldsmiths, Hyderabad. Fabrics were rich with silk brocades embroidered with real zari and colors were regal and vibrant. The most expensive film of that era, no money was spared on any details. And in her book titled I Durga Kote, an autobiography, the actress who played Salim's mother, Jodhabai, recalls how lavish the costumes of the film were. Some of the dresses that Maharani Jodhabai wore in this film were lent to the Mughal Yazam unit by the Salar Jang Museum in Hyderabad. The pieces for the Queen from Rajasthan were inspired from her culture, whereas the Mughals had jewelry inspired by their culture. It was this attention to detail that made Mughal Yazam so outstanding. The costumes for every single character received equal attention. Mughal is listed as a Hindi film, but this is not entirely correct. It uses a hybrid of languages based on the nature of the scene. For example, in royal court scenes, highly formal Urdu is used and includes some Arabic and Persian words. In the quarters of the Hindu empress Jodhabai, Hindi is used. In some of the songs, Bridge Basha, a dialect of Hindi is used. This hybrid use of languages is particularly special in this film because it evolved from early Parsi Hindi theatre traditions that developed between 18 and 70 and 1940. To summarize this evolution, the playwrights and performers in Indian theatre came from various Indian language backgrounds and this resulted in a very secular linguistic space in Indian theatre where there was no conflict in mixing languages.
M.K. Syed was the art director for Mughal Azam and he did an exceptional job. There is evidence in the film that he based his work on the research of Mughal architecture. Some sets of the film are extremely elaborate, whereas others such as the jail or the studio of Sankarash is much simpler. Two stages of Mohan's studio was taken over for Mughal Azam. One had hundreds of glass workers, craftsmen, sculptors and costume designers who worked throughout the shooting of the film. M.K. Syed had to make hundreds of sketches for sets, costumes and properties for this particular period. The art director and cinematographer for Mughal Azam were on the permanent staff and did not work for any other project for all the years that Mughal Azam was in production. Most of the film takes place indoors, with the various living quarters of the royals being elaborate and well-designed, having entrances and exits. In more formal places, the floors and the walls are embellished with floral patterns. The outdoor sets are also quite extravagant, especially the depiction of the Mughal gardens as paradise on earth. Mughal gardens evolved from the first Mughal emperor Babur's Charbagh and suits the happy and romantic scenes extremely well. Babur spent a very short period and that too towards the end of his life in Hindustan. He introduced the idea of char, bag. It involved taking an enclosed space and dividing it into four main quadrants. It reflected his imagination of the idea of paradise. This geometrically divided space was alive with a variety of entities like flowing water, flowering plants and pathways. Flowing water was the main element around which the other things were organized. Water reflected the sky, adding more beauty to the landscape. The idea was to keep the wildness of nature out and use natural elements harmoniously. All the romantic and pleasant sequences of the film, especially some of the songs, have been set in these surroundings. The Shish Mahal or the Glass Palace is perhaps the most extravagant set in this entire film. The set was 30 to 35 feet high, 80 feet wide and 150 to 200 feet in length. It took nearly two years to construct this set and it reportedly cost around 1.5 million rupees to construct. The inspiration for this set came from the Amber Fort in Jaipur. They cut the sheets of glass like they were biscuits. K. Asif felt that the quality of local colored glass not being good enough, the required material was to be imported from Belgium at a tremendous cost. This was one of the occasions when the financier mystery bulked at loosening the purse strings, and the matter became a sore point between him and Asif. Eid came around, and as was his custom, mystery arrived at the director's house with Eidi, a gift. This time, to placate his friend, the gift was lavish. Asif accepted one coin as a token and handed the money back to Shapurji, stating, Use this to get me my glass from Belgium. Asif wanted the locks of small circular mirrors to be inlaid into the walls, pillars and the ceiling. For this tedious work, he called in artisans from Ferozabad, a town famous for glass handicrafts. It's important to note that the Shish Mahal scene was particularly difficult to light as the light reflected in the camera as a result of all the glass. It took six to eight hours to light one long shot. The song Pyar Kya To Dar Na Kya was shot at the Shish Mahal for 30 days, also a sequence that was going to be in color, so even more consideration had to be made for it. The cinematographer of Mughal Azam was R. D. Mathur. He faced many challenges during this process. Not only were the sets enormous, but he required more lights and time to complete his work with his team. He developed a special technique to refract light off the mirrors from the camera in the Shish Mahal set. Most of the shooting for Mughal Azam happened at night, but the technical work started every afternoon. For three years after Mughal Azam released, the extravagant Shish Mahal set stood high at Mohan Studios and became a popular tourist destination. The battle scenes in this film were at the time the most realistic ever seen. There was no input digitally. In his quest for authenticity and a realistic representation, K. Asif had repeated rehearsals for these scenes. These scenes were shot near Jaipur and required the actors to wear leather jackets over vests of cotton wool and on top of a heavy suit of armor. When the male leads of the film had difficulties in mounting the horses and giving the required shots on the field, B. R. Kedkar came to the rescue again, making 
making paper horses with the actors mounted in studio. These shots were edited into the main battle scenes. The Indian army along with their soldiers, horses and ammunition were used with the permission from the relevant Indian government departments. This was perhaps the only time that the Indian army played a role in a film and staged mock battles. A soldier on horseback was killed during the making of Mughal Azam when a cannon was fired too soon. Thousands of people lived in tents on location for the battle scenes of this film. Shooting for Mughalayazam was completed by 1959 and Mughalayazam was shot in three languages. The English version called The Great Mughal never saw the light of day. The Tamil version titled Akbar was not much of a success. Practically this meant that close-ups, long shots, songs and dialogues had to be done three times. This contributed to the long duration of filming and the copious amounts of footage. A. Asif's quest for perfection resulted in 80,000 feet of negative, of which only a fraction was used. 20 songs were recorded for Mughal Yazam, and only half were used. Two of the discarded songs were added after the release of the film. Mughal Yazam was the first film for which an all India press show was held. K. Asif invited about 60 prominent film critics from all parts of India to be guests. The invitation cards were like elaborate royal scrolls. The premiere of the film was a star studded event. By the end of its first week, Mughal Yazam became one of the highest grossing films of all time. But besides the madness and the mayhem associated with the making of the film, another possible reason why Mughal Azam was so intriguing to the public was because of the real-life tumultuous romance of Madhubala and Dilip Kumar. The most romantic scene in the film is this feather scene between Anarkali and Prince Salim. It's this, this image that's on my t-shirt. It is perhaps the most or one of the most romantic scenes in Indian cinema history. In the genre of romantic scenes on the screen the feather scene has no peer. Prince Salim with a large feather in his hand slowly caressing Anarkali's face. It is night time. There is complete silence but for the raga in the distance. There are no words spoken. He, K. Asif, proved conclusively that great love can be projected without even a touch and that the most exquisite and most memorable love scenes are those that are the least offensive to the sense. A survey conducted by Fumfe in 1980 on the most unforgettable romantic scenes in films, it showed that years had not altered the impact of this feather scene. Indian actress Rekha had said on this scene, What is left unsaid is always more attractive than what is said, especially in matters of love. One of my favorite love scenes for years has been the one between Dilip Kumar and Madhubala in Mughal Yazam. The manner in which Dilip harasses his beloved's face with a feather has strong sensual overtones. The music travels through the long tresses of Madhubala and touches the audience. The scene is worth it for the melting expression in Madhubala's eyes. The serenity and peace the love scene exudes despite the undercurrent of tension is unbelievable. So the sad reality was that the relationship between Madhubala and Dilip Kumar at the time of shooting this very famous feather scene was over. They were not even on speaking terms during the shooting of the scene. In Dilip Kumar's autobiography he revealed that matters began to sour between us thanks to her Madhubala's father this attempt to make the proposed marriage a business venture. The outcome was that halfway through the production of Mughal Yazam, we were not even talking to each other. The classic scene with the feather coming between our lips, which set a million imaginations on fire, was shot when we had completely stopped even greeting each other. What connected the audience to this film was really the love story between the characters of Anarkali and Prince Salim. Despite the status of the relationship between Madhubala and Dilip Kumar in real life, this scene is significant for the narrative because we are aware that Anarkali and Prince Salim are constantly under threat of being discovered and yet in their love story they are at peace and we see it in this scene. Mughal Yazam was an obsessive project for the director K. Asif who wanted his vision to be real. With this film, he left a legacy unlike any other filmmaker, but it is the sheer scale of the artistic team of Mughal Yazam that really sets the film apart. These artists were drawn as the best in their fields, and that is the reason why this film remains so relevant and it made history. And from that observation, I think it's interesting to note that there has never been, and perhaps will never be, a remake of Mughal Yazam in Indian cinema. So I wanted to do this video essay because Anarkali is one of the most famous depictions of court 
dances in Indian films and soon the Netflix show Hira Mandi will be out and I think that Mughal Azam and Bansali Productions have a very special connection. He has said on numerous occasions that he is inspired by K. Asif and Mughal Azam and this kind of grand filmmaking. If you are interested in the history of Hira Mandi and a discussion of court dances or tawaifs and these kinds of characters in Indian films, I discuss it in this video titled The History of Hira Mandi. I will link that video here. You guys in the next video.